have your Bibles, and uh, I hope you do, please turn with me to Acts chapter 3, as we look primarily at verse 19, as we go through the book of Acts here, repent therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out. That times of refreshing, verse 20, may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Verse 22, Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaim these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. Repent. John the Baptist preached, repent, preparing the way for Jesus. And in Matthew 3, 2, we see him say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus even begins his ministry in Matthew 4, preaching the very same message. Matthew 4, 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent, for the kingdom is at hand. The kingdom of heaven. And this was the theme of Jesus' ministry. Repent. And throughout history, God's authentic spokesmen have preached repentance to sinners. Even in the Old Testament, we see the theme of repentance. God instructs Jeremiah to tell rebellious Israel, Jeremiah 8, 4 through 5, you shall say to them, thus says the Lord, when men fall, do they not rise again? If one turns away, he does he not return? Why then has this people turned away in perpetual backsliding? They hold fast to the seat. They refuse to return. God commanded Ezekiel over in Ezekiel 4, Team six. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, Repent, and turn away from your idols, and turn away your faces from all your abominations. God has a long history with Israel. And we are not going to turn there at this point, but if you went to 2 Kings, Chapter 17, it, it gives a summary of the sad history with them. The primary focus of the Old Testament prophets was to bring Israel to repentance. Yet Israel refused and then suffer. And this message doesn't change. It hasn't changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament. It's still the message 
even today, that we should be preaching. Repentance was what Peter preached in his first sermon that we've seen in the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost. And in the second sermon, Peter's preaching, here we are in that right now that we're looking at in the book of Acts. This is our example. This is our example for today. Paul in Ephesus preaches repentance. Acts 20:21, 20, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what we've got to get back to, disciple making. We, we go out, we ask the question, are you a good person? Are you a good person? And sadly, tragically, for so many that proclaim they are Christians, their answer is, I'm trying to be, yes I am, I think I am, I want to be a good person, I think I'm a good person. Some confidently, yes, I'm a great person. I have a great job. I don't break the law, I do all good things. And the tragedy is that they don't understand how wretched they are. That they're sinners. I question whether or not they understand the value of the cross. Romans 3, 9 through 15, For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin, as it is written. None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. Their throat is like an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asp is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Peter here begins with your guilt. In this book of Acts, but nobody likes being guilty. Nobody likes feeling that <laughs> comes with being guilty for being wrong. I took my, my kids out the other night. We went to dinner. I have an amazing young daughter that I love. It's growing up. I pray to the Lord to continue to raise her as a disciple, but we're sitting at the dinner table out in this restaurant. She's got a little cup of chocolate pudding. She goes to get up out of the seat and accidentally knocks it off the table. It happens. I just, I guess I kind of gave her a, a look as I said, please be more careful. That was it. Just please be more careful. Accidents happen. I get that. But even in this, she says, but, 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 I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I, I just gave her a look and I'm like, really? Who else did it? And all I'm asking is that you be more careful, please. But immediately, she identified herself as guilty. And she didn't like it. Who knows? Even something that's so small that really we 
took a few napkins, cleaned it up. It was easy to take care of. But I think this is so evident in our culture that this is how so many are addressing their sin today. When they do something wrong, they want, at that point, to take the broom, lift up the rug, and put it under the rug. They don't want to address their sin, their wrongs. And they want to blame everyone else. They want, it seems like they want to blame the world for our wrongs. I don't want to take responsibility for when I mess up. That's the attitude. It seems to be just engulfing our culture. And Peter does the unthinkable. Peter throws these guys, they've all gathered around because of a miracle. The lame beggar has been healed by the power of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, a man. And they gather around the sea, and Peter does the unthinkable at this gate at the temple. Peter throws their sin right out in front of them on the table and says, Let's address it. Jesus does the same thing. Just an example, if we're not going to go through the whole text here for time purposes, but John 4, chapter 4, 16 through 26, a woman at the well. And Jesus is standing there with her and he throws her sin right out on the table in front of her. He says, for you have five husbands. And the one you now have is not your husband. And she says, well, what you said is true. And I can't deny it. It's true. You've called me out. I get it. And then she tries. She identifies. Well, you, you obviously are somebody with some knowledge. And then she tries to redirect. She tries to pick up the rug, put the put it under with the broom and redirect. <laughs> she tries to, you worship over here, we worship. Jesus says, wait a minute, wait a minute. He addresses it, says, don't worry about that. Let's get back to what's important. And stay focused. And that's not easy. Right? People, people don't like that. And I think it's why, tragically, most preachers aren't preaching repentance anymore. People don't like it. It convicts them. It cuts them to the heart. It cuts them to the core. It makes people, like the woman at the well, feel uncomfortable. And we wouldn't want to do that today in our churches, would we? Except this is what Christ preached. This is what Christ did. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And we are supposed to be imitating Jesus, are we not? Which means we are to preach repentance. Because this is what leads people to the cross. To repent. 
forgiveness of sins. And the majority of people today want, you, it's everywhere, self-help lessons. They want steps. Can you please give me A, step A, step B, step C, step D, so that I can get through this and accomplish this. But there is no salvation in that. No salvation in self-help lessons of this nature. It doesn't lead people to be convicted, to be cut to the heart and lead them to authentic repentance. People have to be cut to the core. The Holy Spirit It's the sword, the sword of the Spirit. The Word cuts. And then, because of this, they ask, right? What must I do? What must I do? And Peter doesn't just beat him up, does he? No. He starts off throwing it out there. It's uncomfortable. They're beat, they're beat up. This group is beat up. What must we do? And Peter comes to the end of his sermon here. You've rebelled. You've rejected. And you've executed our Lord and Savior, the chosen one, the Messiah, the one whom you've been waiting for. The one that's been prophesied. Peter takes and shifts gears. He throws it on the table and then he shifts gears and he goes and he shares hope. Peter breaks them down and then offers hope that might build them back up in such a way that they run to hope. Isn't that encouraging? That no matter what you've done, what wrongs you've done, there's hope. Hope found only in faith in Jesus through repentance. The word repentance, metaneo, Greek, Repent means change one's mind or purpose. And we need to understand this isn't just uh, I make a decision. This is a complete change of mind. It's a transformation. This is a renewing of the mind. And it's done by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's something that, that you and I can't do apart from the Holy Spirit. And that leads, as the change of our mind occurs, the renewing of our mind occurs, to a different type of behavior. Do not be conformed to the ways of this world. And when your mind begins to change, your behavior can begin to change in such a way that you are not conformed to the ways of this world. Peter uses the word return. And in the Greek, epistrepho, Meaning for sinners to turn back to God. It's a radical change. You're turning away from wretchedness. The ways of the world. 
and you're turning away from the ways of the world back to God, who is perfect, who is sinless, holy, set apart. You're turning back to God who is good. And if God is good, then we are not. And our behaviors, your behaviors, my behaviors, and actions at some level, the what we do day in and day out, has to begin to look like our Lord and Savior. You begin to live every day that God blesses you with to strive to be more of a reflection of Christ. You are becoming to the world a reflection of Jesus. That's, that's what it means when we say I'm set apart. That's what it means to say I'm no, I'm in the world, but I am no longer of the world. And so the question is, as you honestly examine yourself, is this how you really look? And you need to be honest in that. Is that happening at some level? And this isn't, we need to understand, showing up on Sunday, checking the box, I'm good. Now we'll never do this perfectly in the flesh. However, through sanctification, the process in which the Holy Spirit makes us more like our Lord and Savior, more holy, and that must be occurring at some level, in the midst of this radical transformation that's occurring in your life as you return to God through repentance, which is given to you by the power of the Holy Spirit because of Christ that's dwelling in you. And I just want to, I want to, if, you, if you're not sure about that, I want to reinforce this with some verses. Now, I'm not going to read them all. You can go back. Luke 1, 16 through 17. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. To make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Acts 9, verse 35. And all of the residents of Lydia and Sharon saw him, and they what? They turned to the Lord. Acts 11, 21, and at the hand of the Lord was with them a great number who believed, and they turned away from the walk they were on, evil, looking like the world, back to moving towards the Lord. Acts 14, 15, Acts 15, 19, Acts 26, 18, it's everywhere. 2 Corinthians 3, 16, but when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. 1 Thessalonians 1, 9, for they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. To, to serve God the way he has commanded us. And it's a delight. 1 Peter 2, 25. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And we see in Matthew 21, 28 through 37, Jesus gives us an off 
authentic illustration of true repentance. What do you think? A man had two sons, and he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he changed his mind and went. Hold on to that one. And he went to the other son and he said, Sam, same thing. He says, and his son answered to him, I, I go, sir, but did not go. Sounds like, sounds like something my kids might do at this point. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you didn't, did not afterward change your minds and believe him. Your actions didn't change because your mind didn't change. You didn't go. This is a radical transformation, a change in someone's life. And it's necessary, absolutely necessary for true repentance to have authentically occurred. Now, I give you this illustration, hypothetical, of my son Miles that I love very much. Miles is a great kid, so I know that he would never do this. And he hasn't done it. But, I left the car keys on the table and He's 13, got this great wild idea, hypothetical, that he was going to take the car. So he goes out, he puts the key in the car, starts up, and he's going to ride it around the block just for fun. And he does it. And he comes back, and as he's pulling in the driveway, I realize something's wrong. And so I'm standing at the end of the driveway, and he starts to pull into the driveway. Now, at this point, I want to look at two scenarios. Okay? Two. First, he pulls into the spot. He knows he's in trouble. You can see it on his face. Okay? He gets out of the car, starts over towards me, tosses me the keys to the car, Said, Dad, I messed up. I'm sorry. He goes on in the house. Just walks on in. Now, let's rewind that to the second scenario. He's coming in the driveway. He sees me. Immediately, I see tears start to come down his eyes, from his eyes, down his cheeks. Okay? He pulls in, you see his head kind of just go over as he begins to turn the car off, and he knows he's busted. He knows he's in trouble. Okay? So he, he slowly gets out of the car, really tears just flowing now, bawling, just can't stop, comes over to me just ever so slowly. I put my hand out, he places the key so gently in my hands and said, Dad. I don't know what I was thinking. I am so sorry. Please forgive me. And I will go to my room and stay there until you have come up with a proper punishment for me because I deserve to be grounded for doing something so stupid. Now, the first scenario, I can, a 
assure you, as he tosses arrogantly the keys, yes, he's sorry. Don't get me wrong. He, Miles is sorry at this point. He is. But I can assure you, in his arrogance, as he tosses the keys to me, though he is sorry, worldly sorry, and we're going to look at that, and he walks on by, I am not pleased. I'm not happy at this moment. As a matter of fact, I've, I've gotten a little more upset at this point. And then, of course, with the second one, I feel bad for him. He, I feel really bad for him. And I offer him forgiveness because he really is sorry. Now, I'm going to use him again. I love him very much. I want to use him again in another example. I asked him to move the wood pile. And so, Miles, I'm, I need you to move the wood pile. And Miles goes to move the wood pile. And then, come back and look out the window. Nothing's moved. I, I go to find Miles. Where are you? He's in his room. I go up to his room. I said, Miles, what are you doing? You're supposed to be moving the wood pile. Well, Dad, I'm planning it out. I'm planning out how to most efficiently move the wood pile. Miles, I just want you to move the wood pile. Just please go move the wood pile. Miles says, okay. A couple hours later, I come back and I go, hey, you know what? I'm going to check. The wood pile hasn't been moved. I go, Miles, where are you? I'm in my room. So I go up to the room. He's got a bunch of buddies. I'm like, oh, yeah. what are you doing? We're planning out how to move the wood pile. I just want you to move the wood pile. Can you just move the wood pile? He didn't do it. You're going to see, hold on to that. I want that to make sense to you. And it will in a minute. Change must occur. Now God uses five ways to urge us to repentance. The Holy Spirit first at some level whether it's a little or a lot, and that has given you understanding to God's revealed truth. And that means that you've been in here, in His Word, and that the Holy Spirit has given you understanding, anointed understanding to His truth, His story. You need to understand That, when you read a verse out of here, there's only one meaning for that verse. And that's God's meaning. He inspired this, and it's his story, and there's one meaning. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't many applications to the text. Okay? But at some level, the Holy Spirit, and that's why, that's why you can read this, you can know this, you can academically have understanding knowledge to this, but not have anointed understanding. His truth. 
And we should be seeking that. And when that has happened, authentically, you know it. And you understand His truth, even in a little bit. It should cause you to confess. It should cause you to be led to repentance. Which means God is good. God is holy. We are not. Therefore, we need to understand because of the Holy Spirit, His truth, through our confession of our wrongs and our sins, for we are guilty before Him in our sin. Before the judge of judges, our dad, just like Miles was. We all under that. This is a great example of God's word to cause repentance. The rich man in Lazarus, Luke 16, 19 through 31. Because here's the thing. God's word is enough. It's enough to turn people to repent. But they've got to hear his word. Luke 16, 30 through 31. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be conceived if someone should rise from the dead. Basically. Look, if they didn't listen to Moses and the prophets, if they're not hearing what God has said, just because someone rises from the dead, and don't miss this, just because someone rises from the dead and they see, experience the miracle, it, they still, what we're saying here, is that they still won't be persuaded to repent. They're not going to. And in the Gospel of John, the title of this section is The Purpose of the Book, John 20, chapter 20, 30 through 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. Verse 31. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. It's all evidence. All the evidence that you, that I, that we need. And it's been given that we are now without excuse. We have the answer. Christ is the answer. Christ is, whether you like it or not, Christ is the only answer. There is no other answer. And those who refuse to authentically confess, face their wrongs, repent, without excuse. You ever seen the movie War Room? And the man, he, he's messed up and his wife's been praying for him and he repents. He comes and he begs for forgiveness from God, from her too. He doesn't just stop with God. He goes to her and says, man, I messed up. I'm wrong. Forgive me to his wife. He had not stop there. He was stealing money from his company and he went there and confessed knowing that he might go to jail. Now, that is authentic repentance. I'm sorry. In a godly way. He went, threw it all out on the table.
table and faced it. No matter what the consequences were, I'm going to do this God's way. He felt sorry. Number two, God uses sorrow for our sin to lead us to repentance. When we do something wrong, we feel guilty. We feel shame. Sometimes fear. Fear of the consequences that might come with the wrong we've done. We feel sorry. And this can be a good thing. It can be a bad thing depending on the kind of sorrow. It can lead us to repentance, which is a good sorry, a, a godly sorry. Or there's a bad one, a worldly sorry, a worldly guilt and shame that doesn't lead to repentance. Being sorry and repentance, we need to understand, are not the same thing. Being sorry and repentance are not the same thing. Repentance is a turning from, around, back to God. 2 Corinthians 7, 9 through 10. As it is, I rejoice. Not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. You hear that? Because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Whereas worldly grief produces death. And we must understand the difference between worldly sorrow and regret to sin. And godly sorrow and regret to sin. Because godly sorrow leads to true repentance, which brings salvation. And there are many that haven't had this. Christians who believe. Many have a worldly sorrow. They're sorry but they really haven't repented and received repentance to get forgiveness for salvation. And worldly sorrow does not lead to repentance, but understand this because it's eternal. It leads to eternal death. Our sorrow, feeling sorry, for our sin must turn us. There are a lot of people that are sorry to their wrongs. There's a lot of people, right, that are sorry to their wrongs. And they are not saved. Because they have not turned away from their sin. Judas felt remorse for what he had done. Judas had handed over Jesus to the authorities. He had betrayed Jesus. And Judas felt sorry. He felt sad. He felt remorse about this, about what he had done, his actions that he had taken. Judas had rebelled and rejected Jesus Christ. And in doing so, he had sorrow and regret. But it was, don't miss it, a worldly sorrow and regret. Judas never truly, authentically repented. Judas then, therefore, understand, was not right with God. So one can have sorrow, be sorry for their sin without repentance, just as it's possible to have knowledge of God's word without repentance. Same thing with the story of Miles. He felt bad, right, taking the car, first scenario, 
but never repented. He was sorry, but he wasn't really sorry. He was sorry. He felt bad about it. Give me the keys and off he goes. Let's see what I can get away with. Just toss me the keys, off I go. But the second scenario, I felt terrible, Miles, felt terrible about taking the car. And he confessed it authentically, his heart. And he wouldn't ever take the car again. Wouldn't happen again because he truly had repented and I forgave him. He accepted it. So if you're struggling in your life and the first two haven't worked, well, I hope it never gets that. Hopefully we get it in understanding, but then God is good. Number three, God is good and his goodness should lead us to repentance. Romans 2, 4. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? God's kindness is meant to to lead you and me to repentance. God's goodness is for the purpose of turning us around. And there are many that say, I believe in Jesus. And they would say, I don't need to change. I don't need to change my mind about Jesus because I believe in him and I'm good with him. Don't miss this. It's kind of the Good Samaritan, right? The priest goes down the road. What must I do to get eternal life? The priest goes down the road. He knows the knowledge. He's got it. I'm good with God. But Jesus turned around and says, he wasn't good with God. The Levite wasn't good with God. The lawyer asking a question, was it good with God? They thought they were good with God, but they weren't good with God. And there are many people that are out here, the majority of Christians, many, who are on the wide path of destruction that is easy, that say, I believe in God, and I don't need a change in my mind. I'm good with God. And the challenge and the tragedy in that is that if you have not surrendered to Him as your personal Savior, then what you say really is not faith because you have never truly committed your life to him fully. But when you do this, it is a radical transformation. And you are coming to him in complete Trust and God's goodness is designed to draw us to Him. Matthew 5 45. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for He makes His sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. God is good. And yes, He's good all the time. To draw us to him away from evil and back toward him who is good. Now, if those three don't work in bringing you to authentic repentance, hang on, here comes tough love. Where do you think that comes from? God, number four, sometimes rebukes us to draw us back to him. Revelations 3.19, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Why would God rebuke you? Why would God chase you in such a way? Because Dad wants to turn you around. You are a mess 
in the flesh. Wicked in the flesh. Sinful in the flesh. And God wants to turn you back towards him which is good. And sometimes God allows us to come under some really serious situations to bring us to change. Sometimes he nudges us. Sometimes he gives us a little shot. Sometimes he throws us, so to speak, off a cliff that we might be shaken and wake up that we will be drawn back to him. God is trying, if you don't see it yet, different ways to get our attention. You can believe in Jesus, but be in complete rebellion against him. Rebellion in your heart. And it may not be easy to throw it on the table, but we need to. And you need to understand, you, you, you may have come here all your life, attending somewhere all life, you may have read this and, and, and know this. It's not an issue of knowing the Bible. This isn't an issue of knowing the Bible, even in the sense of the academic, but rather a commitment issue. What does that mean? Well, I want to do this. And God, I don't want you, because I want to do this, God, I don't want you to mess with my life. So God tries first to understand it. You've heard. Now turn. And then if that doesn't work, he says, okay, well, I want you to feel sorry for your wrongs. And then see my goodness. I am good. Understand that, that that might return. And if you reject all of these, God might move to rebuking you, throwing you off that cliff. Have you ever experienced something in your life that was tragic? That God was using, you probably didn't even think about it at the time, that you were just thinking about how horrible it was, and we hope not. We hope that you were drawn to God, and it led you to repentance, true, authentic repentance. Just because you do good things for God and you show up on Sundays, don't forget, doesn't mean you're being led to repentance. So God might have used something tragic in your life. And then the question is, did you listen? And the question now is more importantly than did you listen, did you respond accordingly to God? Did you turn back towards him? Or after that was over, let's say whatever the tragedy was, a disease or something, you made it through it and you're good. Did you run away from God back to the ways of the world or surrender your life to be more committed, committed fully, surrendered to him in your life? Here's my life. It's yours. I'm going to do whatever you want. Not my way anymore. You got my attention. You woke me up. Have you committed yourself completely to Jesus Christ or not? And I hope it never gets to this point in your life, but I have to say, I see it a lot in your culture. I see people in the midst of God rebuking them in such a way 
And unfortunately, they still seem so many to reject them. I don't want to commit the way you're asking me to commit, because I still want to do what I want to do. I still rebel against, they just rebel against Jesus. And I just shake my head and, and wonder, why? How is this possible? And I pray that it isn't you that God uses some of these, one of these, because eternal life is on the line. Because at the end of the day, number five, God's final judgment will come. Acts 17, 30, 31. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed the day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance by to all by raising him from the dead. Why is it so important to preach judgment? People don't like it. People don't want to hear it. Most people, because of that, don't today preach it. It doesn't put people in the seats. Thousands of people came to hear Jesus. Thousands walked away. So why did Peter preach judgment to this crowd that had gathered for a second time? Why did Jesus preach judgment? Why? Because there's coming a day when Dad is going to judge the world. And it is judgment that leads us to repentance. Just like those gathered there before Peter, as Peter preaches to them their sin, their rebellion, their rejection of Jesus, we are also, just like them, guilty. So what do we do? We confess. And through repentance, we turn back to God, which brings about, we need to understand, conversion. Conversion, a sinner who turns back to God. That's what conversion is. Someone that has turned back to God. And a great example, here you go, picture this, you got a circle. You split the circle in half. Okay, so you got a half circle, half circle. And on one side, you've got faith. And on the other side, you've got repentance. And faith makes up half the circle. Repentance makes up the other half the circle. And then when you put the whole circle together, that gives you conversion. Repentance is turning towards God. Faith in Christ dwelling in you. And that generates conversion, a change, a radical transformation in your life. When all my friends, when this happened to me, they began to look at me and say, who are you? What happened to our buddy Aaron? And my answer was, Jesus happened. Repent and be converted. You catch that? This isn't something that you 
can do. It wasn't something I could do. I tried everything in the world. Jobs, relationships, money, all the things of the world, and none of them worked. None of them will ever work. There is no hope in the ways of the world. Our hope is found in the only answer, which is Christ. And therefore, we must have repentance to be converted. Not something you do, but something that happens to you. And you, when it happens, undoubtedly know it. There is a changing of your mind that occurs. And you have authentically confessed your sins, receiving true repentance, leading faith in Christ. And that results in transformation. And the process of sanctification begins at some level to be made more holy like Him. Now what name is this? This is not Miles going to his room to plan it all out, to escape, to get away from, to avoid. Okay? And then when God, so to speak, put this together, comes and puts one of these things in front of you, understanding, sorry, goodness, hopefully not rebuking, you respond. You go and actually move the wood pile. You don't go back up to the room, call some friends together, but that's so often what the many do. Jesus says many are on the wide path to destruction for it is easy. You see, he's up there in his room planning it out. It's so easy. He swept it under the rug. He's sorry he's not moving the wood pile. But he's not moving the wood pile. <laughs> and you've got to examine yourself. Have you gone and moved the wood pot? God says move the wood pot. I'm the wood pot. God says repent. Have you laid it out honestly before God and now you're turning away from it because you've been given repentance and you have been given conversion and you're now turning away from the ways of this world back towards God and you're now set apart. And you've got to examine yourself honestly in that because eternal life is at stake. Will you pray with me? Father, God Almighty, you are an awesome God. And those that are struggling with this, that don't have absolute assurance in their salvation, Father, I ask you, Spirit, I ask you to move in such a way that they will respond and take action. That they will turn to you and commit their lives to you, Lord. For you are the greatest treasure here on earth. And they find a relationship with you that transforms them. That they die to themselves and are born new. 
that they turn back to you and begin to look more like you for those you place around them. In your perfect, holy, sinless name, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, 